started. Uh, my name is Herbig Baumgart and I'm the Applied Studies Coordinator here at SciERC. And uh, it's a real great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Guolian, who will be teaching an augmented reality masterclass here at SciERC. And uh, for the students, um, there's only a few spots left uh, uh, for this. So if you're interested, please contact Lisa Russo or Dwayne Euler to sign up for the masterclass with Guil. It's a, it's a total of 20 contact hours with him and you'll receive one credit for that. So the schedule is already posted. And uh, again, you can speak with Lisa to get all the details for that. So if you're interested, uh, please sign up for that. Um, Quill is one of three co-founders of Photogram, um, together with Cameron Newham and Nick Vandenberg. Um, Photogram is a design uh, research practice and technology startup building a platform for designing and making mixed reality. Photogram's design practice has been internationally awarded most recently for the design and construction of the Tallinn Architecture Biennale Installation Competition. Photogram's clients include leading universities, um, multinational architecture firms, industrial designers, engineers, and artists who are building with mixed reality applications for full-scale construction, public art, and architectural fabrication. Uh, Guil has held academic positions at the RMIT, Melbourne, and Monash universities, where he developed design research in the fields of mixed reality environments, autonomous robotic fabrication, behavioral design systems, and creative application of machine learning. This work has been published in leading computational design conferences and journals, including uh, IGAC, Acadia, Rob Arc, and he has been giving talks and presentations and workshops at international institutions, including UCLA, ETH, uh, now SIAC, uh, MIT, USC, uh, Stuttgart ICD, UCL, UTS, Tongji, and Jinghua University. His talk and the masterclass has been a long time in the making. Uh, some of you might remember uh, Guerl and Nick were here last year for a short demo um, uh, before the whole COVID thing. And we have been planning to do this class ever since. Um, it led Sayak actually to purchase several uh, HoloLens headsets, uh, which were kind of a prerequisite for the, to run this class. And we currently have two AI selective uh, seminars built around this uh, augmented reality technology. Uh, one is taught by Sumin Han and the other one is taught by Dwayne Euler. And to kick this whole uh, semester off, uh, we have now a master class with Squirrel and the Photogram folks. And we are really super excited to have you guys here and uh, show your work and uh, inspire us. And uh, we are grateful you will be working with our students uh, through this fall semester. So without further ado, I want to welcome Guel Jan to SIAC. Thanks so much, Herg, for that introduction. Um, just give me a second and I'll get all of our technology set up. Right. Uh, okay, um, hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, yeah, so first of all, um, it, it has been quite a long time since we first um, came to SIARC and did a demo of what we we're working on. I think it was almost two years ago actually when we were, um, were there, time's been flying pretty quickly. And it's a real pleasure to run this masterclass, even though it's um, going to be remote and I won't be able to meet you all in person, but um, I really appreciate the invitation from Herwig and Dwayne uh, to be involved at SciArc. Herwig, as you mentioned, uh, Fologram is a tech startup that also does some design and fabrication work. Um, Myself and Cam have backgrounds in architecture and design. And largely we do design work to sort of eat our own dog food and prove what's possible in mixed reality. And I thought that in this, um, this talk would be an opportunity to share some of both the goals for that design work, what we're trying to achieve um, by working in mixed reality, and also some of the things that we've learned in um, doing sort of prototypical experiments using the HoloLens and trying to build things that were previously perhaps not quite unbuildable, but certainly incredibly difficult uh, to achieve in any other way. So we're really interested um, in Fologram in using mixed reality to improve skills 
to leverage intuition, to facilitate bespoke design projects and to engage in materials in new ways. Um, and to begin with, there's a bit of background and context I think that I'd like to share to, to try to explain why we're interested in those things to begin with. Um, the context that motivated us to start our company um, really came out of a lot of experience working with, with robotics and automation as a researcher at RMIT. And I wanted to sort of start this lecture by articulating a polemical position with regard to automation upon which most of our work in mixed reality is based. So enormous capital investments by companies like Katira in industrialized construction processes are a pretty clear glimpse of the future of our industry. Um, and by owning and standardizing and automating the entire production chain, they can achieve more precise, cheaper, repeatable and faster uh, production of, of buildings. I think this is definitely where our industry is headed, but in this future, the role of the architect and the designer becomes that of a specifier of selecting finishes and modules from a kit of parts. We're not very interested in that. We want to develop a hybrid approach to industrialized construction that can benefit from the efficiencies of digital processes while maximizing human design agency. We call this, um, or we're, we're starting to call this, an interest in mass bespoke rather than mass customization or um, production. The goal is to broaden rather than to narrow the spectrum of possible designs and limits of what and how we build. A really interesting framework for thinking about like mass bespoke um, fabrication as opposed to standardized automation is the idea of slowness. So a lot like the slow food movement or the romantics, um, all of us at Follogram are pretty interested in traditional craft in drawing on characteristics of local ecosystems and regional expertise, in challenging the need for standardized industrial production, and just generally taking fairly idealistic dispositions towards quality rather than quantity. And as a designer, I'm really fascinated by, and I think it's important to talk about my own sort of aesthetic um, biases here because it informs a lot of the work, but I'm really interested in um, in forms that emerge from negotiations between competing systems over time. That's something I've been fascinated by for about a decade now. And um, work by artists like Lucy Irvine capture a lot of these sensibilities. Um, this is a project called Covering Ground by Lucy. She's an Australian sculptor. Uh, made from low cost materials sourced from a local hardware store, Lucy creates these incredibly complex sculptures entirely by hand relying on craft skills and material properties to guide a fabrication process of designing and making, which kind of converge. And the final form emerges over time, um, guided but not imposed by the designer. The end result of these sorts of approaches to designing and making, they tend to look like they're modeled on a computer because they follow sort of um, rule-based approaches to producing an object. But these forms are exceptionally difficult to model digitally um, because it's so hard to capture both the sensibility and judgment of the designer and the complexities of the material behavior using digital simulations. And this kind of fundamental challenge, let's say, of capturing sensibilities and judgments of human designers while they craft something, as well as wanting to be able to model kind of complex phenomena digitally they're, they're things that we're trying to tackle with uh, augmented reality uh, in a lot of the design projects we've done. Um, something that I've always been interested in as well and that informs a lot of the work, which I'll talk about later, is in how um, these kind of parallel processes of designing and making can be scaled up, so to speak, in the same way that modular design gets scaled to industrial construction in factories. I'm very interested in what architecture could look like if it was just as feasible to produce forms like Lucy Irvine's as it was to produce modular building components. That's really fascinating to me. Um, and to explore these interests, I've actually, I mean, a long time ago now, it's been put on hold since we started Follogram, but um, I began a PhD looking at this polemical idea of slow robotic automation. So thinking about how autonomous robotic systems could be optimized for observation and gradual action rather than speed, for flexibility rather than repeatability, and for nuance rather than perfect precision. 
And because this is a lecture for SIOC students, a project that came to mind that captures a lot of these sensibilities um, was one by Jason Payne called Rawhide that was exhibited around a decade ago. And it shows the sort of ambition of this approach to designing anti-fragile architectures that anticipate and benefit from complex environmental or material behaviors over time. Like this is reacting to, um, to material uh, is something that we're really, really interested in achieving through mixed reality. So with a PhD, I'm pretty lazy and impatient. Um, I was interested in slow processes, but didn't want to wait for a long amount of time to actually conduct experiments with physical material. And so myself and also um, Cam, the other co-founder at Fologram, we spent a lot of time learning how to model material behaviors digitally. And these essentially become like our design tools. So we're modeling how um, maybe you could simulate processes of material erosion or deposition or flux over time in order to speculate on sort of what sorts of architectures could emerge by combining these, um, these behavioral models to produce complex phenomena. Uh, learning how to code these sort of behavioral models tends to produce some pretty strange um, possible architectures, things that suggest, you know, um, landscapes that look like they've been produced over time. You can work at multiple scales and they're, they're basically fictional um, proposals for architecture using a set of techniques for simulating material behavior. Um, and I guess similar palette of tools can be repurposed to explore smaller scale designs, which are less speculative in terms of time scales. Um, and this is a project I think, which really represents my fascinations and ambitions as a designer for the kinds of things that I want to produce. Um, and I, I think, again, it's important to fully disclose these so that you understand um, the work that comes later. So this was a design competition for a, a small meeting room um, at RMIT. The idea is that it would be created by a gradual repetitive accumulation of inflated recycled plastic bubbles. And there's a kind of direct relationship between the material parameters and the architectural constraints in these projects. So the bubbles become larger and more transparent towards the top of the structure, they're denser um, and more opaque towards the bottom where they need to bear load. You can articulate essentially material parameters to control things like privacy, the thickness of the wall, acoustics, things like that. So it's this kind of interesting way of using material parameters to articulate um, very direct things the architect is trying to achieve. Uh, we lost the competition though, um, because the jury rightly pointed out that this just couldn't be built. Um, and we have a bit of a habit of doing design competitions where we submit proposals that can't be built. Um, we thought the Thailand Lin Pavilion is one of them actually, but um, we ended up having to figure out how to build that one as well. And I think as rightly so, the jury pointed out this couldn't be built. Um, it, it essentially would have been too dangerous, it would have taken too long, it's too complex, um, just not easy to fabricate. And to automate this thing's construction, it required computer vision, real-time robotic control, tools to control how the plastic is, is um, actuated. Um, and all of this would have to happen in real time. Um, I think a bit of a habit of mine is in trying to incrementally, or maybe it's more of an obsession than a habit, but incrementally shift what we think is possible to build. And so, I wanted to show you like a year's worth of work in trying to essentially develop techniques that would um, enable the production of these pavilions. So we built autonomous robotic systems that could basically observe and react to material over time. Uh, we worked with, um, with students at RMIT to build end effectors for robotic arms that could essentially extrude uh, plastic material. We designed dyes that could be connected to digital pressure regulators in order to um, like basically from grasshopper parametrically control a lot of the material properties in this pavilion. So this is the extruder extruding tube and then you drag a slider in grasshopper and you're able to control the pressure in that tube. So you can, it's sort of like bubble blowing um, with a plastic printer using a, a digital model. There's a lot of emergent material effects here, things like folding and crimping that we're really fascinated by. And we learned a lot in producing um, essentially 
tooling that would enable us to build these impossible structures. Um, one thing that was really interesting is being able to fabricate extremely lightweight, thin walled 3D prints um, really, really quickly. But basically it was a year's worth of work in trying to teach a robotic arm to behave like a craftsman, to be able to just observe what material does and then decide intuitively where to place more material in order to construct that, that kind of pavilion design autonomously. And all of this could have been really easily done um, by hand if you were just able to give a fabricator a constant reference to what the intended design result would be. So if you could describe what the design intent was, like that's the real challenge um, for fabricating these kinds of structures where you have very sort of um, loose control, let's say, over the material that is going into those structures. Now, um, when the HoloLens came along, this basically eliminated that or solved that problem um, for us. So just as we were extruding those plastic bubbles, RMIT purchased a couple of HoloLens headsets. This was in late 2016, I think. Um, we got our hands on them and within a few days, we were pretty aware of what they could be used for. And this is the very first project that we ever did uh, with the HoloLens. Um, so it's a bit embarrassing showing this, but I thought I would anyway. Um, basically, rather than um, teaching robots to engage with material and approximate human craftsmanship, we thought we could just enhance our own ability to work. Um, with digital models, just using analog tools. And because hands are far more dexterous than robotic um, arms, it opened up a whole lot of more exciting fabrication techniques that we could work with that were well beyond the automation of even like extremely sophisticated um, computer vision systems. So Cam and I made a really simple tool for streaming Rhino models to the HoloLens basically. And then um, you could use that Rhino model viewed through the headset as a guide showing you where to place and glue river pebbles to try to make this weird little blobby um, prototype here, like just as the first experiment to see if it was possible or not. And because the Rhino model instantly updated on the HoloLens, um, we'd built a live link between Rhino and the headset. It meant we could very, very quickly try out different visualization techniques while we were fabricating the structure. So we, we tried basically showing the whole surface showing contours, showing point clouds, showing normals, strips of like sections of the model, um, which is what you see here, until we figured out what was easiest to build from. So having this constant reference to the finished form and design intent of a project, it really eliminates a lot of the need for digital rationalization of design models. And this is one of the kind of um, most exciting things, I think, uh, of working with, with holographic uh, documentation for construction. So digital models can become used like useful as approximate guides rather than exact instructions for things. And the exact construction sequence or shape of each part in the design could be left up to the skill and intuition of the person making the part. Um, the other thing is that rationalization to 2D parts or to standardized details is a really skill intensive exercise. You really need to know what you're doing with um, the digital modeling software you're working with. It creates super steep learning curves for students who are working with digital tools for the first time. And by eliminating the need to teach how to rationalize um, uh, like design proposals, we were able to like basically speed up the design build learn feedback loop because students could very quickly model something and then um, very quickly physically prototype it to become experts in the fabrication techniques that they are exploring. Um, a lot of the complexity in construction projects generally, so those projects, the early prototypes we did, they're all, they're really exciting, but they're at extremely small scale. Um, and uh, generally speaking, if, if you wanna scale up these approaches, um, you need to be able to work with building scale materials that, that much is obvious. We'd done a lot of work with um, robotic fabrication of parts. Um, I showed the bubble extrusion before, but we'd also done far more kind of conventional fabrication. Um, this is two robotic arms rod bending, uh, inspired by some of the work of, of um, Wes McGee and Dave Pygram up at Michigan. 
And even though you're able to easily automate part fabrication, um, a lot of the kind of problems that we're experiencing with, with any kind of um, digital fabrication is the assembly of the parts is the real challenge. So if you're automatically fabricating parts, you're typically producing huge drawn documentation sets, um, things that look like this, many, many parts all labeled uh, complex 2D instructions for things. And then stuff gets assembled by, um, by human labor in the end anyway. It, it, of course, it depends a little bit on the, the kind of structural systems, material systems you're working with. There's examples of ro robots doing brick laying or doing sort of CLT timber layup and things like that. But if you're working with some um, flexible parts at all, generally speaking, assembly is still done um, by hand, even if the parts are fabricated with CAD CAM processes. And so one thing we were really interested with the HoloLens as soon as we started prototyping with it was trying to solve this problem of, um, of assembly using holographic guides. We did a few experiments with building scale materials. Like um, the, one of the first experiments that we did was to try heat forming parts in place. So you can wear a HoloLens while you also hold an acetylene torch, um, which is kind of exciting. So you don't need to robotically bend parts. You can just hand bend them. Um, though these later on, we ended up prefabricating um, and hand bending the parts individually just to speed up the fabrication process. But something that was really interesting we found is that when you work with holographic design models um, for assembly, especially, you can pretty easily invert the problem space of um, fabricating complex designs. And by that, what I mean is when you have a constant reference to a finished form, even if that form is very complex, it can become very simple to build the form approximately. Um, and this is an important idea. So typically, if you're trying to build something complex and you're using digital fabrication techniques to do so, complexity is usually all or nothing. So the end product is exact, but it's very difficult to build. And the exciting thing about mixed reality fabrication by contrast is you have this new spectrum to work with. So you can build things quickly, but approximately or slowly and carefully. And as a fabricator, you can essentially decide where you sit on that spectrum while you're building something. So this is a digital model um, of, uh, that we're trying to build with the OxyTorch. It's 10 mil square bar. It took about 20 minutes to model because there's no rationalization. All of the parts self intersect. They're all unique. Um, it's really just capturing design intent. And then this is the built object, which we built in under a day. Um, and what's important here is it's an approximation of the digital object. So these two things aren't exactly the same and that's very intentional. And it's because we were making trade-offs. So where the object needed to be precise, like where it was interfacing with the top of the chair, for instance, it was precise, we were careful. And in other parts of the structure, we were able to make changes to the design, like slight changes in order to make it much easier to build and reduce the total fabrication time. So this is a deliberately imprecise, but very complex object. Um, and I'm sort of excited by what the um, implications uh, this will, could, could potentially have on architecture. I mean, a lot of our work is exploring exactly this, like how does design change if very complex things become easy to build, but approximate, um, it's really exciting. Now, the idea of using augmented reality for construction is definitely not new. So a little bit of quick background and history here. Uh, the term augmented reality was invented by two engineers at Boeing um, used to describe a system to assist with the manufacturing of aircraft wings. What's really important to point out here is the digital content that you see is minimal. So to create a good AR experience for work, you typically just want to show only the digital information you need to perform a task and nothing else. So this was back in 1992, they prototyped this system. AR headsets have been around for even longer. So Ivan Sutherland in the 60s developed a heads up display. Architects have been interested in augmented reality for construction um, at least since 1996, um, where several researchers at Columbia University uh, prototyped a system to assist with assembling space frames. 
more recently, there's been some really amazing work done with developing custom hardware solutions for on-site um, construction. This is some work by Tim Sandy, Catherine Durfler and others at ETH. And it's essentially a monocular system for doing part tracking to provide sub millimeter uh, accurate guidance for brick stacking, which is really, really incredible um, and interesting. And these guys have since started a company actually to commercialize this technology. And on construction sites within industry now, augmented, rea augmented reality in the last couple of years has just become more and more um, ubiquitous. It's still not on every construction site, but any stretch of the imagination. But Arup are now claiming that they have a um, trim black vision device on in every office um, for viewing things like basically doing site walks and um, quality assurance on site, viewing things like rebar, uh, stuff like that. So the idea of augmented reality in industry, um, in real world applications, it's definitely already here. This is not a kind of new technology that's going to have an impact further on in the, at some point in the future, you know, five to 10 years down the road, it's already being used right now on real construction sites. And so um, as students, you should, you should really be thinking about how you're going to engage with it. Now, what Follogram does to get to Follogram is um, we essentially make it really easy to prototype mixed reality experiences using the HoloLens. It's, it's quite different to um, a lot of other solutions on the market. What we're trying to do is make it so that any creative artist, designer, regardless of digital expertise, can prototype something in mixed reality. So long as they know Rhino and Grasshopper, that's all you need. And we're interested in reducing the time it takes to test an idea. So you don't want to spend weeks developing an app just to find out that your tool can't bend the shape that you want to bend, for instance, or to find out that your UI doesn't make sense. Um, mixed reality is a fundamentally new sort of interface for engaging with computers and digital content. And so um, it's important, I think, to make it easy for people to learn within this medium. So what does Follogram do? How's it work? Um, again, as I mentioned, the goal is to reduce prototyping time. Um, it works on the HoloLens, uh, Oculus Quest, and also on mobile. We built a mobile app just to make Follogram extremely quick to use. So you just pull your phone out, you connect to Rhino, and you can see your model in AR and start interacting with it. Though it's important to point out that if you've tried um, augmented reality on mobile phones, the use cases are completely different to those on the HoloLens. Um, Fologram works by creating this bi-directional link between Rhino and mixed reality devices. So you can view your models um, on the HoloLens or on your mobile phone or on the Quest, and then you can use gestures and sensor data on the device uh, to interact with those parametric models. This lets you build really simple applications. So you might be making something which lets you draw in space, or you could track markers, or you could just be building a bricklaying app. It's incredibly flexible. Uh, if you know some basic grasshopper, Follogram's almost definitely going to be about 10 times faster than any other way to prototype just about anything else in mixed reality. To show what it's being used for really quickly, um, specifically by creatives, so people that aren't necessarily really digital savvy, um, it's being used by object designers. This is some work um, by my partner. She's using the headset to do these kind of um, small scale enamel timber ve uh, steel vessels. Uh, it's being used by uh, people like Jeff Farquhar Steel from Artillion Studio. He designs already in um, virtual reality. So he had a way of modeling really complex forms, but until he got his hands on uh, the HoloLens, he had no way of accurately fabricating them. And Jeff's since won some art prizes for the work he's done in mixed reality. It's an exciting way of engaging with the full suite of um, plugins, like the ecosystem of Grasshopper. So anything that runs in Grasshopper, you can now run it in mixed reality. So this is a kangaroo simulation where you're able to grab the anchor points of that simulation and um, move them around and view them in physical space. So it could be used for one-to-one -one simulations of tensile membranes and things like that. Or you can start interacting with robotic simulations. Really any um, third-party application that plugs into Grasshopper can now be you know, turned into a mixed reality experience using Fologram. 
Now, as designers, um, we're mostly interested in in um, not so much, let's say, gimmicks. So in those last couple of um, short videos I showed, they're exercises in exploring something for the sake of exploring it, like just seeing what happens if you run a kangaroo simulation in mixed reality or what happens if you can tell a robot where to move using your hand position. Um, their thought experiments. What we're really interested in doing is finding low hanging fruit where you can use mixed reality to extend the limits of what is possible to build. Um, so we did a, a I'm going to skip through this project pretty quickly, but um, it gives you a sense of how you can use mixed reality for design processes, for design review, for fabrication, for assembly, and for post build analysis. And at each step, you're actually solving a problem. Um, it's not a gimmick. It's taking something that would have been very difficult to achieve and um, finding a way to make it very simple uh, using holographic guides. So at uh, Cadria, it was a design conference in Beijing. Um, this is a couple of years ago now. Um, we ran a short workshop. Um, the idea was to build this sort of folly from bent pipe. This is the fabrication space we had. It was um, uh, a bit of a chaotic environment. Um, and what you're looking at here is a 3D scan created by walking around that site with the HoloLens. And this was exceptionally useful because we were able to build a point cloud model just by walking around the site that let us work out, say, where columns would be, how big parts could be, whether we could move the structure from where we were building it to where we would be exhibiting it. And you get all of this for free with the headset. Um, it's always scanning its environment. That scan is always being streamed into Grasshopper. And so you always have some representation of the physical space that you're in within your digital model. It's a really low res scan, but it's super useful for doing things like site planning. The structure we designed was uh, made from these kind of interwoven bent steel rods. And we wrote a whole lot of code to try to essentially model as many of the fabrication constraints as we could, but we didn't get it perfect. It's really hard to understand these kinds of structures on a screen. Um, and so to mark up the design and find areas where we needed to improve the model, instead we just walked through it on the HoloLens, marked it up by hand, so recording your hand position over time. And this is all streamed into Rhino. So uh, someone can sit at a laptop and fix the model at the same time as while somebody else is walking around in the virtual uh, model and marking it up. It just makes it really, really efficient. To fabricate the parts, these are all bent by hand. Um, again, we, we just um, generally looking for quick and easy ways to do things. So the idea was we brought over in our backpack a cheap analog uh, pipe bender and then we added a holographic overlay to that bender that would show you the exact shape of each bend in each one of the parts in the design. Uh, what that looks like for the person doing the bending um, is pretty simple. So you place a pipe into the bender, you wear the headset, it shows you the exact orientation and um, uh, angle of the bend. So these are three dimensional bends, they're not two dimensional parts. And then you can um, use that as a guide, which will just tell you whether or not the part is or isn't correct. This is uh, using that holographic interface. So you never need to go back and um, change anything on a laptop. You're able to essentially control the digital content that you see just by interacting with virtual um, user interfaces. So this is a good little clip showing the bending. Um, I also wanted to point out that we were prefabricating parts and normally when you prefabricate parts, you end up with drawing sets that look like this. Um, you need labels for every single part. You need to um, annotate how those parts join to the rest of the structure. With our model in particular, um, the CAD model didn't really help. It just looks like spaghetti. So it's really hard to work even from a, a 3D model um, to create assembly instructions for these kinds of structures. And it's hard to work from the physical built structure. Um, so the built thing also looks like spaghetti. And because these are flexible joints, when you install one part, it isn't necessarily rigid. It can rotate around whatever it's joined to. And so you're trying to 
constantly negotiate like gravity basically while you're assembling these parts. And all that means is that in order to fabricate structures like this, um, which are sort of very unconstrained in terms of the formal language of the design, you really need a reference for exactly where each part goes and what the overall intended result of the um, assembly process should look like. So this is gives you an example of the complexity of this assembly process. You need to weave a part through the existing structure. And what you see on the headset is um, basically the current part that you're trying to install as well as a reference to all of the other parts uh, in the structure. And you have a simple user interface for toggling through showing those parts one at a time or showing all of them so that you have that fabrication information when and where you need it. To prove how um, well this process works, we also needed to digitize the model. Um, I think it's really important to be able to state how precise um, these approaches are, but pipe structures like this are difficult to scan with cheap scanners. You can't scan them with a connect or with photogrammetry, for instance. And so we invented a system of digitizing the structure also using the HoloLens. So the HoloLens can track fiducial markers, um, basically stream the positions that um, the device detects into Grasshopper and you can then use those positions to recreate a digital model um, from those marker positions over time. So this is a short video screen capped from Rhino showing that marker being moved around. The marker is always positioned on a rod and from that you can basically work out the, um, the center of the pipe and just reinterpolate a polyline through that. Um, so this produces pretty accurate representations of the completed structure. It's a really effective way of redrawing um, the as-built conditions from the um, within a digital model, let's say. So this is the initial um, chunk of this structure that we built. That was the, the digital model before we built it. Uh, this shows the variations, like where there was error. So red is error, green is accurate between the digital model and the um, physical thing. And then this is the digitized uh, object. So the as-built physical thing, um, and that's the structure. So you can see there's really not a lot of difference between these. Um, for, if I recall correctly, I think the average deviation was 16 millimeters. And this is from 16 millimeter diameter tube. So just placing a part on the wrong side of the tube would give you that amount of error. Um, and the maximum deviation, I think, was about 25 millimeters uh, or an inch. But we wrote a paper on this, so um, you can go call me out on that if you want to. I, I can't remember exactly what it, what it was. So the reason I want to show this is because we will come back to all of these techniques later in the talk with the pavilion um, where we were trying to essentially leverage the benefits of working with mixed reality without worrying so much about precision. Um, so with these pipe vent structures, there's quite a bit of tolerance in the material. The material is flexible. There's not a lot of tolerance in the joint. Um, the joint always has to essentially form a parallel connection between these two rods. And when you're working with rod, rod bent structures like this, um, it's also really hard to capture more conventional architectural effects. It goes without saying, like it's difficult to create surface or enclosure or anything like that from purely rod. And so um, with, the, with the pavilion, which I'll talk about later, it was really an attempt to try to make, um, to work with the, the capacity of the material more and also to express some architectural effects a lot more by, by using sheet and surface materials. Okay, a quick little break um, from looking at projects just to look at little experiments that we've done. Um, these are really cool, so I wanted to share them. And it's this idea of like the bender, the analog bender is kind of like an augmented tool. Um, so you add a holographic guide to an analog tool and suddenly you can make things which begin to approximate the precision of, of um, fully automated machines. And I think this is a really interesting idea. The idea of adding holograms to analog tools and turning them into things which are intelligent 
or adding almost stenciling markers onto physical materials so that you can constantly observe the shape of those materials in digital models is really exciting to me. So here's a few projects exploring those ideas. One of them's um, by some uh, clients of ours in Japan who recently did a project using a chainsaw and a HoloLens, so showing complex compound cuts through logs which were sourced from a forest, scanned, um, remodeled in Rhino, and then streamed to the HoloLens so that you could basically use, um, uh, you know, know exactly where cuts needed to be made in order to assemble these logs together into small structures. Another project which is kind of interesting and I guess a provocation to, uh, to you as students if you're using the, um, the HoloLens is the idea of trying to track physical tools and then provide feedback to fabricators during fabrication so that you become better at using those tools when you have that feedback than, than if you didn't. And that's really important for subtractive processes. So things like carving where the cost of making a mistake is really high if you remove some too much material, for instance, it's really hard to put it back again. Um, so carving processes where you're able to track a tool and provide feedback as to how close you are to an in, like an intended cut position is really interesting. And then this third idea is the idea of stenciling fiducial markers onto material. So if you're always looking at this material with a HoloLens, and you're able to track the positions of these markers, as you change the shape of the sheet of material, the corresponding marker positions can produce a corresponding like tracked um, change in a digital sheet within your grasshopper model. So you could guide a fabricator how to form any arbitrary sheet into any arbitrary shape without actually needing any 3D scanning um, techniques, which is kind of interesting. We've also done a bit of work um, like grounding the presentation again now with more conventional construction. Um, so those last couple of projects are just exciting and speculative, but it's also exciting to try to work with um, trades and industry and try to improve uh, the kind of the quality, I guess, of the work that they do. So we did a project with some bricklayers in Tasmania, uh, all brick they're called. And these guys were really fantastic to work with because they immediately saw the potential in using mixed reality within their, their industry. Um, specifically, I think they saw a potential to basically upskill themselves to produce better quality work and to eliminate a whole lot of tedious tasks like, you know, measuring and doing set out and things like that. They find really tedious um, by instead just using a holographic guide um, showing them exactly where each brick uh, would need to be placed. We built some really simple brick laying apps that run on the HoloLens for them. Um, that a bit like the bending app, you could click on a button that you'd see in mixed reality and change the course of bricks that you'd see on the headset. And then you could place a brick within the footprint that you saw. And that was all of the information you needed to build any arbitrarily shaped wall. And we've done experiments like this with foam bricks, which are lightweight, you can glue them together. It's an extremely quick process. This was a structure we made in Germany. It's about 4,000 foam bricks. It was built in four hours by a team. I think it was four pairs of people. So it's really, really fast. Um, you can capture some pretty nice qualities and effects. And with all brick, we were just able to do this with um, actual brick and mortar construction. So this is the, the design. This is the digital model. Um, you can see the buttons which let you interface with that digital model, turning it on and off. And this is Colin talking about the project. There isn't a single brick on there that lines up to anything. Every brick is different. This would take you like two weeks. Yeah. Fine guy. And a lot of that would have to be, you know, made up. Do you know what I mean? You're not going to get it exactly like this would be. So the way the uh, holographic app works is um, the bricklayers are wearing the headset while they're laying the bricks and they can essentially tap on one of these buttons to change the course and the design. That's so simple that anyone could do it, even apprentices on site, which is pretty exciting. So that's all the bricks, right? Yep. So see how you are here. That one's good. Yep. This one here, 
shows it's got to come round. So just treat that like like you do your string line all the way around. Mm -hmm. so hit that back. The other thing that which is really exciting with the bricklayers is um, they were able to work in fundamentally different ways using the headset. So ordinarily with a project like this, it'd have to be done with just one guy. Um, and you'd have to start brick, like laying the bricks from one end of the course and just run it to the, to the other end in order to get the bonds and things right. Whereas what they managed to do with the headset is they were able to build it in parallel because they could both see the same digital uh, instructions. So one of them had run through laying the bricks approximately and then Colin, sorry, Ben. I once seen a program oh, on John Lennon, you know, and he reckons every song that he made, he used to think, he used to get scared the fuck. I'm going to stop now because I'll never make anything better than that, you know. Mm. That, on that sale, <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> fuck, it's time to stop. I'm nervous that I can't make nothing better. <laughs> so Colin's obviously pretty happy, but um, he's happy because they're not only able to save a lot of time on the project because they can build it in parallel, um, but also they're just able to achieve a better result. And because they're working with sort of new tools and technologies, they're bringing some innovation and change to the industry. They're really excited about being able to essentially attract new talent to their industry as well. Um, so it's not just an argument for efficiencies. It's an argument for quality, which comes back to one of our, original kind of goals for Fologram. Okay, so now let's have a look at the, the Tarlin Pavilion um, and talk about some of the ideas behind that. The main thing that I wanted to talk about with this project is, um, is about the hardest part of the project um, from, from my point of view at least, which was trying to um, digitally model quite complex uh, material behaviors in order to like guarantee that this thing would be buildable. Um, that, was, that was the real challenge. The project was completed with quite a few people. The design was a partnership between uh, Cam and myself, uh, Samin Harm, who's on the faculty at SciArc, uh, Igor Pantic from the Bartlett in London and uh, Format Engineers. Um, and it was made possible mostly from just incredible support from so many different people around the world. And I'll um, mention a few of them as I share the project. So the idea with the, the pavilion um, was really, we thought, well, let's just use augmented reality to make um, steam bending efficient. So one of the problems with or challenges with steam bending is that you need to create custom jigs and molds for every part that you make. And then you get some material spring back when you take it off the mold. And so it's very difficult to even approximately fabricate parts um, with this technique. Because of that, it's also really time consuming, tedious and expensive um, as a technique. And we thought maybe we could solve a lot of those problems by using AR to set out formwork really efficiently. And this was initially what we thought our formwork might look like, a kind of a Frankenstein scaffold system. Um, as well as to perform like really efficient quality control on parts. So you'd always be able to see how much springback there was because you just view the digital model through the HoloLens, uh, overlay it with the physical model and then whatever difference you, phys you could see, that was the springback. So um, we thought there was an opportunity here. We'd never done any steam bending of, of timber before. Um, we're coming into this completely green. We did a couple of small tests in our studio uh, the idea of setting out formwork, like very approximate formwork using an augmented reality guide worked really well. And then it seemed pretty possible to shape the material around that formwork using a hologram as well. So because that seemed feasible, we just cranked the design up to 11. Um, we wanted to sort of capitalize on the language of curvature that comes from bending and twisting timber strips. Um, it was going to be pretty difficult to make anything that wasn't bending and twisting. Uh, we knew curvature would give us some strength um, as well as multiple layers of material. So we we're ramping that up as well. And uh, we wanted to explore, you know, things like variation in, in texture and color and, and different timber grains and things like that as well. So this is an early sketch study from the competition. Um, basically sort of pushing timber parts through a simulated field in order to capture some of these qualities. Um, we've, we, about halfway through the design process in the competition, um, 
we became so interested in the formal qualities of the project that we um, we became less interested, let's say, or prioritized the fabrication constraints a lot less. So we didn't really imagine that we were going to be asked to build this thing um, because we weren't modeling it in any way that looked vaguely buildable. Um, we thought maybe we could make it in chunks uh, and then install the chunks together. That's how things typically get built. But we really had absolutely no idea uh, how the thing would be made. We just liked how it looked. Um, and so we submitted it to the competition and um, uh, it uh, ended up being selected by an incredibly supportive jury. Um, no one, I mean, this image was um, posted on Arc Daily and everyone on Arc Daily just was commenting on the project saying this can't be built. And we were in the exact same boat. Um, we had no idea how we were gonna build it, but the jury um, trusted us to figure it out, which, which we really appreciate. It's very rare that you get a jury that, that puts that much um, trust in a inexperienced team. Um, so we threw ourselves into it. The first challenge was solving for spring back. So we built our crazy Frankenstein scaffold system, which is what you see on the left, tried steam bending apart, took it off the scaffold and what you get is the red piece. So the black, the black strip is, um, the timber piece on the scaffold, the red piece is when you take it off. Essentially, timber just wants to be straight. Um, it's really, really difficult to both anticipate spring back, um, especially, and also to, to um, minimize it. So one of the first things that we tried was um, exploring kind of composite systems. So we thought, well, let's, um, you get spring back when you take parts off a mold so let's leave them on the mold and try to lay up multiple parts at once. So you get stiffness from double curvature, essentially like it wouldn't be able to spring back. You'd have a kind of bending active uh, system. We really didn't want to add any substructure to the design. So we could easily solve the spring back problem just by like laying up parts over a frame, for instance, but we couldn't actually do that. Um, it wasn't, an option just because the competition budget was so tight and we didn't have any time, it wasn't actually gonna be possible for us to digitally fabricate any kind of substructure. We couldn't CNC anything, couldn't laser cut anything. Um, everything in the design had to be from a really simple production chain. So just the exact same dimension of steel, the exact same dimension of, of timber, and that was it. Um, so we tried fabricating these parts. So um, using basically like a simple formwork system uh, that was screw fixed to a, a false floor. Uh, the formwork initially was set out using a parametric model. So it'd show you exactly where each one of these little stands needed to go. Um, and the formwork is rationalized into a few different angles for each stand. And what you might be able to just make out here is underneath this hologram of the part is a timber strip. Um, and so this was the very first one that we fabricated. It was a, at a workshop at Temple University with um, Andrew Witt, James Pazzi, Chris McAdams, and Tim Rusterholtz, um, who are all from the art school. Well, James is from Airbnb, but everyone else is from the art school at um, Temple. And they, they knew how to use tools. They knew how to, they'd done some steam bending of timber before, and they were hugely helpful in suggesting a couple of techniques that we ended up using all the way through the project. One was um, steaming timber in bags, which made a massive difference. But what we learned in this first prototype, um, it was a two day workshop actually, two day workshop, we made thousands of parts in two days. It was sort of two 20 hour days. Um, what we learned is that assembling chunks of steam bent timber parts is really, really difficult. You get a lot of spring back, especially at the ends of parts. And even though you have a hologram showing you the shape a part should be, if um, the material behavior isn't able to be forced into that, uh, if the material can't be forced into that shape because it's too rigid, because the part is too small, um, you just end up getting a cumulative error. So we built a fairly significant chunk of the pavilion in, in two days, but it was wildly inaccurate. It was off by meters. Um, and so we knew we needed to change something if we were going to actually deliver this project. Uh, we then did a workshop in Aarhus, uh, in Denmark, um, this time with Ryan Hughes and Dagmar Reinhardt. 
And what we tried in this workshop was um, basically we came up with an innovation that just enabled the entire design. Uh, and that was steam bending the parts in really, really long bags. And you don't take them out of the bag while you bend them. Uh, so this let us do like bend 12 meter long parts um, It increased the work time that we had massively and it reduced the total number of parts in the structure from sort of thousands down to 130 or so, I think, timber boards. Um, each one of these boards is about 12 meters long. And because they're so long, you can also eliminate spring back. So the entire part becomes flexible, um, which was really, really uh, exciting to us. So once we knew that it was actually possible to fabricate the parts, we then needed to rationalize the design. So this is a digital model of the pavilion uh, that we were working with to create the parts. And the design rationalization was really, really intense. So even though we knew we could fabricate or steam bend parts pretty accurately using the HoloLens, um, we still needed to have a pretty sophisticated digital model to ensure that this composite shell of hand bent approximate steel brackets and hand bent approximate bendy timber strips would go together into the form um, that we designed and also go together such that our um, engineering model um, was actually right. Like this thing wasn't going to fall down. So the board constraints, th this is really all the complexity of the project as far as I'm concerned. So we needed to be able to uh, model board geometry that approximated as closely as possible the physical behavior of timber. So how that timber would twist and bend when you tried to form it into a particular spline. And we needed to do that in order to model brackets that connected the timber boards. We needed to make sure that the board curvature never exceeded um, anything that we could build or bend. The boards and the digital model couldn't intersect because we didn't have time to produce any custom notched joints or anything like that. Every single strip had to just be the same um, continuous section of timber. The board had to unroll to a straight section because we could couldn't laser anything, uh, time. we need to consider spring back. Um, there's just so many of these constraints. And because there were so many constraints, um, uh, this presented the challenge that we, we couldn't just model all of this by hand. Um, it was impossible to model it by hand and it was impossible to algorithmically solve all of these constraints at once. And so the solution that we ended up coming up with was a kind of an in-between process. So of approximately digitally simulating all of these constraints all at once uh, using physics solvers. So this is a, the Rhino model showing one sort of collection of these strips. And the color here indicates um, how far off they are from being fabricatable. Like basically red means that the strip doesn't unroll to a straight segment. Uh, little yellow dots show intersections between strips Basically, it's modeling the, um, or illustrating the fabrication constraints. And what the physics solver does is it goes through and it tries to negotiate between the shape of the spline that we'd drawn, which is where we wanted a strip to go. So you can see that here is these um, black lines and the shape that the board wanted to be in order for it to unroll into a single straight strip so that we could fabricate it without any laser cutting, um, just from standard stock material. So this is really interesting to me. It's, um, it's showing this kind of like approximate way of capturing a design, uh, which is this negotiation between what we know we can build and a pretty tight set of constraints and what we want uh, to build as, um, as designers. During fabrication, this is what a strip looks like. Um, and this is what you view on the HoloLens. So you have this single straight segment, so which has a particular length, and then you form it um, or steam bend it into this three-dimensional curve. What we did during fabrication is we also showed the color um, or the curvature, sorry, of the strip along this length so that we could use really cheap, crappy, low quality timber to lay up each one of these boards. So you could put timber that had knots in it anywhere where the, there was minimal curvature because the board was basically straight. And then wherever you had quite tight curves, that's where you'd put your really nice straight grained 
um, quarter sawn timber um, so that you were sure that you could bend those tight curves uh, without accidentally breaking apart. And this worked exceptionally well. Um, I think we broke about five parts throughout the structure. Uh, the other part of the structure was designing the brackets. Um, extremely difficult as well. Um, mostly because the brackets are just, again, we didn't want to build anything as a composite or as a, um, a substructure and this whole thing's a composite shell. And so all of the parts are really flexible and floppy until the entire thing comes together. Um, and the brackets don't run in like nice continuous loops around the structure. Uh, they're all just almost arbitrarily placed um, uh, pieces. And that's because of this requirement to fabricate them from straight stock stainless steel bar. So we didn't need to laser cut anything. The constraints here were mostly due um, from like what we could bend with an analog bar bender. So each bracket had to have a maximum bend angle, minimum bend spacing, maximum bend inclination, um, all these kinds of things. So we could bend it with an analog bar bender and they needed to unroll straight. We wanted them to be on the inside of the structure, uh, a whole lot of other constraints like this. Uh, this is what it looks like in the kangaroo simulation. So you can see this bracket initially is not straight. It's just roughly digital model, digitally modeled in. And then we use kangaroo to basically model all of these constraints. So it's trying to pull the bracket onto the boards within the tolerance that we can fabricate and also make sure that this bracket unrolls to a straight section of steel bar. Um, what this looks like in the factory is um, you have a whole lot of formwork set out just using cheap scrap um, timber. You have one person wearing the HoloLens um, guiding the forming of these 12 meter long timber strips uh, while they're still super hot in the bag. And then you have a team of people that are assisting with that. What's interesting here is that um, when you can just place the formwork pretty arbitrarily following a digital model, it means that anyone can do it. So it just effectively distributes um, skills and capabilities across the whole team. Um, anyone can perform quality control. Everyone can see the shape of the strip that it should be. If um, Igor, in this case, wasn't able to form a strip, someone else could grab the Hollands and shape it. And it's this very sort of collaborative approach to making. So this gives you a sense of what a part looks like once it's been fabricated. This is the steel bending process. It's pretty similar to the rod bending that I showed you before. We have a, a kind of a holographic interface that lets you select bends in the part. You can always see the overall shape of a part. So because we're making these by hand, the bends are pretty approximate, but you don't get a cumulative error. And then on site, you have a holographic model showing you where both strips and brackets need to go. That's super important, mostly because we knew the structure was going to sag and all of the parts are really flexible to the extent where just under their own weight, um, even though we'd accurately steam bend the parts, when you lay them down on the ground, um, they'll just they'll completely deform. Um, so this is what a part typically looks like before it's installed. And because they're so flexible, it's just, it'd be impossible to assemble this without either extremely complex formwork um, or working with far more rigid parts, which would have meant using much thicker timber at higher cost and probably beyond the limits of what we could steam bend by hand. And so having a constant reference to what the overall design intent of the pavilion was, is the only thing that made assembling this possible. Um, it just eliminated the risk of accidentally installing a part in the wrong place. Um, and it, it made it so that anyone could perform quality control. So anyone that put the HoloLens on would be able to see if a part had been fabricated incorrectly or put in the wrong spot. And it, it just de-risked the whole project. So um, to start summing, summing up this project, I mean, a few things we're really interested in. We like the way that the pavilion expresses how it was made. So the kind of form of the pavilion is a product of the flexibility of the timber material and demonstrating the kind of capacity for variation facilitated by the simplicity of the fabrication process. We like the way that um, because you're able to form these kind of stock timber material into any shape, you can start playing with a lot of um, 
architectural tropes almost, you know, the way that a, a wall becomes a column um, or the way that you can express sort of volume sometimes, surface other times. You play with transparency through the structure by twisting the boards in particular ways. You can play with light and shadow. All of these things were, were really interesting to us. A couple of pictures of the project on the site. Um, and it's still there, actually. It's there um, uh, because the next Biennale was delayed by a year. Um, you can go visit it if you ever happen to be in Estonia. So a couple of um, uh, final things to, to wrap up with. Um, these projects that we've showed, they're all kind of, uh, I guess, fairly speculative arty projects. And that's because of our own interest and agenda in setting up a, a kind of an alternative to this um, prevailing approach to automation and standardization. Like we're really interested in pushing the envelope of what's possible in terms of formal expression, um, rethinking kind of use of traditional craft techniques, things like that. But that doesn't mean that there isn't huge opportunity within industry for the same um, tools and techniques. So to show you a couple of those quickly to conclude, uh, people like Windover Construction are using Fologram and the HoloLens for doing things like truss fabrication on site. <clears throat> so um, they were able to essentially halve the amount of time that it took them to um, uh, fabricate and install these trusses using holographic guides rather than drawings. So there's a kind of a great opportunity there. Uh, Art Engineering are another client of ours. They've worked with some um, artists like art plus com uh, to do the documentation and delivery of structures like near nature using entirely holographic guides. So what's interesting here is that the fabrication um, of this structure using the HoloLens was written into the tender process. Um, so they, they delivered the, the documentation of this project using uh, Fologram, um, which just de-risked the project again. So it made QA much simpler far fewer mistakes um, during assembly. And the bricklayers that we worked with before, uh, all brick, after completing that pilot project, they came back to us and um, wanted to use Fologram on an actual construction site, much larger scale. So we ended up developing a similar um, uh, approach for them to deliver the curved bench work of the Royal Hobart Hospital. So hundreds of meters of curved benches consisting of many, many types of cut bricks um, and pretty complex bonds. And so this is just giving you an example of, at the moment, how large structures can be um, working from holographic guides until you start running into uh, issues with drift and precision. Um, we always get asked how accurate the HoloLens is. Uh, we've done some 3D scans of, of structures like these benches by Allbrick uh, again, if memory serves correctly, the average deviation here is around seven millimeters, um, which is pretty good for construction site tolerances, depending on what, what, you, um, uh, what you need. So again, you might work slower in some places in order to get more precision, um, or you can work more quickly in other areas where you don't need so much precision. So industry actually is um, uh, adopting this technology really, really quickly. And so I think it's an opportunity for you guys as, as young architects to start thinking about, again, this sort of inverted feasibility of particular kinds of um, design proposals. So if it becomes as simple or as feasible to build structures with a lot of variation in parts um, or things which are distributed in space fairly, you know, in fairly complex ways, or maybe that require fairly complex materials, materials that aren't typically used on construction sites because they're flexible or difficult to control. Mixed reality gives you an opportunity to start, um, you know, delivering those projects um, at, at lower cost. Um, and that's achievable now. And it's achievable by partnering with um, people in industry. They're also looking for these kinds of technologies. And the main reason they're doing that is because Engaging with these sorts of technologies, it eliminates tasks which are tedious and extends what they're able to do. Um, it improves their capabilities, upskills their team, 
it improves their ability to collaborate. It reduces the amount of rework they have to do. It improves the quality of the work they can produce. And in some cases, it saves them time and money. Um, but the things they're really excited about are the improvement in quality and the improvement in the way they work. Um, and that's definitely what I think the biggest opportunities are for mixed reality. All right, last little thing. Um, as a side project where during lockdown, um, we've built a tool called At Studio. It's um, for creating virtual studio spaces. It might have some connection to AR at some point in the future. Wanted to mention that to all of you in case you want to check it out. Um, but I've got a little bit of time, I think, for a few questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Quill. This was an amazing lecture, really inspiring to see all this amazing work you guys did. And I mean, it's really impressive how you guys uh, work with materials, I think. And it's like the, the, the fact that um, you uh, customize kind of your process based on, on how materials behave. And I, I think it's just, it's really great to kind of look at this tool, both of, of how it's um, already kind of being, finding its way into the industry, but also I think for students, it's really, there's an opportunity there to kind of like up the design and kind of like really work with, with really, really complex geometries and not be afraid of it and being able to, um, you know, kind of like go that extra um, a thing. As you were saying, like with the pavilion, like going into it, you didn't know how to build it. And then like, but you were able to figure it out, like kind of like working one by one sort of kind of issues. So I think it's super impressive. And I'm so much looking forward to the, Masterclass, and so, so I just want to give the students some opportunities, maybe to ask them some questions for you. So thank you, thank you. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thanks, Oleg. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. How, how do you see this technology in the future um, on large scale projects? Like, how how do you see it evolving? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, the first thing to point out is that um, this technology is already being used on large scale projects right now. Um, it isn't necessarily Fologram that's being used on large scale projects because we're really excited by using mixed reality for fabricating things, which means you need a certain amount of precision, which means you need to work at small scale usually. But uh, I think I showed a slide of Trimble's Sight Vision, which is a, a mobile AR application that uses GPS substations for precision. That's definitely being used on a lot of construction sites right now for doing things like QAQC and site walks and safety training and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's happening now. I think as we go forward into the future, um, like in the next couple of years, I think we'll see a lot more um, engagement with mobile mixed reality for a whole lot of other parts of the, the process. I mean, as like Apple begins to release mobile phones with LiDAR scanners in them, the first things that are gonna happen is you'll just start having things like building maintenance being done using mobile phones, um, doing things like RFIs using mobile phones, crowdsourcing digital twins. All of that is going to have a big impact on the construction industry. Um, in terms of what we're interested in, which is, you know, as Herwig mentioned, like facilitating more ambitious complex designs and um, making sort of bespoke design more feasible. Um, I think we're also seeing a lot of engagement from industry in that as well. Um, so where there's overlap between uh, companies that are interested in quality um, and that are interested in attracting new talent uh, to their industry, there's a real excitement about working with mixed reality to, to help achieve those things. So yeah, there's the, it's an exciting time to be working with the stuff because so much is happening so quickly. Thank you so much. And thank you for the great lecture, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I had two quick questions. Um, I was extremely mesmerized by the uh, steampunk pavilion. And I'm curious whether timber was the only option for wood and whether it's possible to re-steam bend an already steam bend piece of wood. Um, 
by wood is the only option do you mean do we think about doing it with steel or do do we think about doing it with ply or um... yeah or any other types of wood um because you use timber i'm just curious on the alternatives yeah so we um we definitely spent quite a long time trying to do um uh like composite laminates so using thin veneer and um uh, gluing that together and forming it over a mold um for a while we thought that was going to be the only way to to do it but we couldn't produce anything of high enough quality uh we kept getting delamination working with that technique um the timber type we ended up using ash ash is really easy to steam bend you want a hardwood timber um it would definitely be possible to to work with like a similar formal language and use steel um and we've got some clients that are interested in doing that so you can do things like you take a strip of steel, you form it into a curve, and then you reinforce it by running a bead of weld along the inside of it to hold its shape. And there's, we're definitely excited by that, but um, the competition almost required you to use timber uh, in the design. So we were locked into that. Re-steam forming parts, yeah, you can. Um, uh, it doesn't, it tends to, um, we didn't do that at all in the design, say. Like we, we didn't steam bend things, figure out we'd stuffed it up and then put them back in a bag and steam bend them again. Um, mostly because it was just, that was tedious. But yeah, you can, you can do it. Um, we thought for a little while we might steam bend everything in situ. So if we'd, if we'd ended up going with an approach where we built a substructure and then we're just going to skin it, we could have steam bent the parts directly over the structure and that that definitely could have simplified a lot of the fabrication process but i mean the whole thing was done in about like the design prototyping rationalization construction was about six months um on almost zero budget for the whole thing and so there's a limit to what we could do yeah thanks uh, beautiful piece congratulations yeah thanks jenna I thought it was, I, I love this technology, Will. And I just, I wanted to say something I think I've said to you before is we tend to think of these technologies as something that moves, uh, that moves toward precision. And that um, if you would have asked 10 years ago, you know, where does technology take us architecturally? You could have speculated on lots of formal ideas and things like that, but, but it ultimately would have led to greater precision. And so it's interesting that here that, that you talked so much about imprecision and, uh, you know, and so it, it just makes me think about like, what does that mean as a design aesthetic? Like, where does that take you, us? Because it completely disrupts that, the expectation. I don't have an answer for that, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I do have a, a concern about, um, I so agree with this idea of the architect, um, needing to kind of reclaim ground as we increasingly become the coordinators of a complex field that, that uh, so often is just becomes quickly out of our hands or the reason we became architects is uh, we, we no longer have time for because of we're forced to deal with the complex coordination of consultants and I, I, I do have my concerns that uh, that the that the use of this technology uh, while it adds to the, while whoever's using it still has the ability um, and regains some ability to hold on to, to design, like the designer stays closer to this technology and the design idea much longer than, than you would with other technologies. Um, but at a certain point, it seems like where it helps is in the hands of the, the fabricators. And so there's a bit of a dilemma here in that what you've done is given the ability of the fabricators to be able to adapt, which is at odds often with the architect's intentions. And so you're still left with that conundrum of, of uh, you know, having to, to coordinate and train your, your fabricators. Uh, anyway, I'm sure you've thought about this and, uh, you know, I'm curious if you've had any revelations about where we go with, with that. Yeah, that's such a good observation. I think um, there's. I think I have two things to say about that. One is, from a, like an idealistic point of view, um, it's 
like it's an interesting thought experiment to just imagine what designs could look like if you were willing to give up some of that control. So if the process of designing was more of a collaboration between who was building it and who was was modeling it, I think there's there's some interesting overlap there. But what is going to happen is it's just going to become much, much easier to remotely view how things are fabricated. So it'll be easier for you as an architect to view through the eyes of somebody that's doing the construction and just say, yes, no. Um, and I think that, so that kind of guidance, quality assurance, quality control, the industry really, really wants that even for things that are fully documented um, to simplify sign-offs and certification and approvals and all the rest of it. And so I think that might actually be a solution to the problem you're pointing out as well, where you want to be able to kind of simplify the documentation of structures and enable the fabricator to use intuition to build them efficiently, basically. But you don't want the end result to come back looking completely different to, to the your design intent. And the solution is just better communication. Um, so communication that can happen instantly and through a shared unambiguous medium of, of a mixed reality environment that might also have some aspects of, you know, scans of physical objects and digitally modeled design objects. Um, and I think, yeah, I reckon that's going to happen really soon, actually. Well, beautiful work. Great lecture. Thanks, Dwayne. I had a quick question. Um, so I, obviously these can go many ways. Um, something I've just been obviously with COVID and all this stuff going on, I'm stuck at home and I have been watching a lot of tutorials on every kind of software you can think of. And even, I mean, even football, right? Like how can I improve my skill set? Even if it's just like a little futsal in the, in the apartment. Um, can, do you see this apply to maybe sports or um, some other aspects where like tutorials could be part of that process as well as um, the idea of you being impatient, but yet, through your work process, it seems like you had a lot of patience. So it was a weird duality because I, I definitely feel that. And then based, I'm sorry, my third part is also jumping off uh, Dwayne's comment and then your reaction to that is like, I feel like the, the malleability of when you're designing and building and as you're building, you did adjust, but it seems like the whole idea was precision and then with subtle, you know, imperfections that came after, afterwards right where i think this should be a a weird back and forth of design physically like i feel like especially at start we don't tend to make physical models as part of the process anymore in terms of let's discover something it's more like okay well with 3d model this thing let's make it real and, and sometimes as simple as like 3d printing but in my undergrad it was more of like physically building with like you know basswood and plexi and and wire and all this thing and my designs always change. Every iteration changed, which completely changed my initial design. So I think this, I think that's a nice, I don't know, this mm. a nice moment. And I don't know if this is something you envision. Yeah, I'll try and work backwards from the first, the third question. Um, the one of the reasons we had to press to digitally model everything was so we could get the structure engineered, um, and because it was a pretty weird structure that was supposed to stand up in a very public place for several years we we really wanted to make sure that we had a high degree of confidence that it, it would stand up um, and format did a really incredible job of um, helping us through that particular problem where the imprecision comes in is more in um, well two things one the digital model was imprecise so if you like the way those physics solvers work is they don't produce like exact solutions to problems. They produce approximate solutions to problems. So all of these parts, they unrolled almost straight, but not quite totally straight. They were unrolled just straight enough that we could approximately build them from straight material. And you can do that because you can, like you see the hologram of when you're fabricating a, a steel bracket and it's made out of a slightly curved strip, but as a fabricator, you can just, intuitively figure out, well, this is close enough. And I'm going to go make it as close as I possibly can to that part. It meant that um, like, otherwise that, that just modeling the project wouldn't have been possible in the time limit that we had. Um, 
So it was about trying to find digital models that were precise enough to be engineered, um, but imprecise enough that we could like model them quickly um, and approximate the fabrication constraints that we had because we knew building them by hand, we were never gonna get them even, you know, like a lot of those brackets because they're made from flexible material, you know, you could pretty easily bend them slightly out of shape if you want to, or um, um, yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole thing of working with, with flexible materials as well meant that precision was pretty meaningless. Like you're going to get a lot of slumps on site and you're constantly having to move the entire structure or, you know, the, the structure as it had been assembled to as closely as possible match the hologram that you saw of the structure while you were building it. And that's just bizarre. I don't like, there's no other way to, to build anything like that without having that constant reference to the intended result. Like if you did it with form work, again, you'd end up with this like um, black and white condition of it would either be entirely on the form work or it'd be off and wrong. Um, so is this, yeah, we had a, a quite precise digital model that gave us a pretty exact idea of what things should be. And then the whole process of actually fabricating the parts and assembling them were approximate. Um, the training question, I remember that one, um, can you use augmented reality for training? Definitely, that's a really high value use case for augmented reality, but mostly because you can see through someone else's eyes and you can look at like a, so I think the training is useful if you're doing it collaboratively. Um, the bricklayers are a great example of using augmented reality for training. So Colin, like the CEO of this bricklaying company, he was training an apprentice because they could both look at a hologram showing where the bricks should be. They could discuss how his technique of laying the bricks was producing, you know, the brick wasn't, wasn't uh, level or it was slightly out of place or he'd used too much mortar or he hadn't cleaned it off or whatever it was because they could see exactly what the end result was supposed to be you could have a really straight conversation around the techniques that he needed to learn in order to achieve that end result so it just eliminated one of the unknowns in terms of training like if you can see what the end result's supposed to be it's much easier to explain how you get there um and i can't remember what your third question was <laughs> sorry yeah how do you do it being an impatient person and uh, getting all that patience back with your baby um, uh, I mean, I think the impatience thing comes down a little bit to, um, um, well, I, I don't, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question to be totally frank. I mean, um, I think I'm quite an obsessive person and, and if, if something needs to be solved, I'm very impatient to solve it. Maybe that's a better way of, um, or even <laughs> maybe not solve it, but fudge it until it works that's probably a better a better way of uh explaining the goal um there definitely wasn't time to be patient with that project i mean um yeah we didn't really think it was possible to build but we we got asked to try and do it and so we just had to rush into it head first thank you so much i have a question yeah uh, what do you think is like the most analog technology that this replaces? Like, I've, it's almost like you can see a world where like, no one needs a tape measure ever again, but like how much farther do you go? Um, well, ironically, it's really difficult to replace the tape measure um, on a, in a lot of cases. Um, unless you're designing things which benefit from approximation. So most of those design projects that we did, especially that, that um, the heat formed steel chair that I showed at the start of the presentation, we're just forming it with an oxy torch. Uh, we didn't have any like measurements from anything there. You would just bend it, bend a bit of stock material till it matched up with the hologram and then just cut it off at the end of the hologram. You, you wouldn't pre-cut or pre-measure anything. You're just working directly from stock. Um, what is the most analog thing I think this replaces? I mean, the, it's drawings, isn't it? it the, the 2D drawing is, or the 2D template is the most obvious thing that this replaces. Or maybe it's another way of thinking about it is, um, is set out is also something that could be replaced. So 
being able to see where something is in space is much better than taking several measurements and then hoping that it's where something is in space. It, it just gives you a very different, um, way of thinking about whether something is correct or correct. You need a lot of skill to read them in a lot of cases. You're trying to infer scale and, and um, a third dimension from a 2D representation of something. And as a result, I think um, like a lot of the time when you present someone with another way of, view, of, of working, engaging with, with design information, like the bricklayers again are a great example, they just take to it straight away. Um, because it's far less frustrating to use. It reduces the risk of incorrectly reading something. It's just way quicker. You don't need to think about it. You can just get on with the job. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say the thing that's holding it back, holding mixed reality back from being used to replace all drawings everywhere is just the precision. So it, it works really well up to a certain scale. And then beyond that, it, um, there, there are kind of increasing overheads to maintaining the precision. Uh, but I, I say that problem's going to get solved in the next sort of five to 10 years as well. And then everyone will just be, they're all, they'll, everyone will already be wearing mixed reality glasses. And so you'll just want to use mixed reality for everything. You, you won't want to look at a paper drawing anyway. You just want to use the interface you already have on your face. So, yeah. I think if there is no more questions, that was great, Guil. Again, thank you. And um, uh, we're looking forward to the, to the masterclass. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. I'll see you in a few weeks. Yeah, I'll see you in a few weeks. Okay, bye. See you. See you, guys. Thank you. Good night.